thanks, Johan, and thanks for these words of uh, introduction from you and the work that's been done by your staff to prepare this gathering. And of course, most welcome to all of you to Stockholm and to the Forum on Internet Freedom and Global Development. You are here, as a matter of fact, because um, you are you. You are individuals from across the world that are dedicated to the values and of the freedoms and the human rights that we all share. You are individuals convinced of the enormous power of the net to shape the future of individuals, of nations and of the world, and individuals that are concerned with the threats to these freedoms and those possibilities that we do see in the different parts of the world. And you are here not only because you are you, you are also here because here is here. So um, let's start with a short commercial for Sweden. I have to say, for start, we did not invent the internet. But I think we can proudly say that we have been a nation that has been in the forefront of the use of the net and all of the different communication technologies associated with it during the past few decades. The mobile cell technology, which has now produced the smartphones, which will soon bring the net to billions of people around the world, has its origins, as you know, here in the Nordic world. And already, I have to say, in 1994, late Stone Age, we had a high-powered government commission headed by the Prime Minister, happened to be me at the time, who declared that within a decade, Sweden should be in the lead in the world when it came to the use of every aspect of the new communication technologies. And I do think that we can say that that's where we are today. That was coming out the other week, the um, latest edition of the Network Readiness Report of the World Economic Freedom. And it does put Sweden at the very top of its rating. And with other Nordic countries, it has to be said, we are not only the top of Europe. I think we can say that we are the top of the world in a lot of these respects. And have been, as a matter of fact, for a couple of years. Proud as we are of this, we are also keenly aware of the fact that technology is moving extremely fast. Politics is not standing still. The world is an incredibly dynamic place. And where we will be, we, Sweden, you, in the next few years, it is an entirely open question. That's on the technology side, and I think you will hear more about that tonight. But it's also a question of values. We did not invent the internet, and the Magna Carta might not have been written by a Swede. But we can claim, I think, a tradition stronger than most in the constitutional protection of freedom of speech and freedom of information. In fact, our constitutional, solid provisions for the protection of the freedom of information and against censorship goes back to 1776. In its latest forms, it dates back to 1992. But in essence, it has remained the same during the centuries when Sweden went from one of the poorest countries of Europe to one of the more developed societies of the world. And it is then the fusion, I would add, of these two strong traditions, the somewhat more recent leadership role in the net transformation of our world, and the longer one of the constitutional protection of the freedom of information that has made it natural for us to make these issues on the freedom of the net one of the cornerstones of our foreign policy in these days. And to this, I think, should be added a third very relevant element. We have a very strong commitment to development issues. Indeed, we are one of the few countries in the world that devote 1% of our GDP to official development aid, and we are, as a matter of fact, proud of doing so. But we also know that our own development as I mentioned, remarkable development of Sweden during the past century and a half, 
wasn't because we got any official development aid. As a matter of fact, we did not. It was because an increasingly open and free society fostered the entrepreneurial talent of individuals and took the fruits of the emerging revolution of science and technology into ever broader sections of society and opened up to the rest of the world. That was the way it was. And that's the way it must be if we are to continue to develop in a world as dynamic and as fast-changing as ours is. Our story is by no means unique. In essence, of course, it is the story of every nation and every society that has been su successful during the past decades or indeed centuries. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Korea, a nation that was thoroughly devastated, first by a world war and occupation, and then, of course, by the war in Korea itself in 1953. When that was finished, there was little more than rubble left. And what there was left, perhaps, of any industrial capacity of Korea was mainly in the north. The two parts of the country went off in different directions. And the result is, of course, there for everyone to see. North Korea is an extremely close society, where the net is more limited and more controlled than I believe anywhere else in the world. Where mobile telephones have only been allowed very, very recently, and then with extreme restrictions. And where the control of information is more absolute than Stalin managed to achieve in Soviet Union in those days. South Korea, the Republic of Korea, after a while of authoritarian development, opened up to democratic path of development, respecting freedom and human rights, and committed to both globalization and the use of all of the revolutionary new technologies. And since then, South Korea has been one of the most rapidly developing economies and societies in the world. It still has some restrictions on the net, which are related primarily to the division of the country and the relationship with the North, that does tarnish its otherwise good reputation, but the essence of the story remains. I mentioned the Network Readiness Index that was published the other day with Sweden on the top. There are 10 different sub-indexes that makes up that particular index. And in one of the most important ones, how individuals can access and use the net. Sweden is still, happy to say, number one. But Korea is number two. And if you look at another sub-index, how governments are using the net, I'm somewhat ashamed to say that Sweden comes out as number 10. And the country that is on the top of the world is, you guess it right, it's Korea. In no other country is so large a share of the household connected to the net. And in no other society is broadband as widely available. This was a country that was devastated, that was ruined, that was hindered by autocratic policies for a long time. Now it is where it is. We have better watch out. North Korea, in case anyone wondered, doesn't even make it on the list of the 141 nations that is possible to rate in that index. There is, I think, a very powerful message in this. The link between freedom, the net, and development. And that is a message that I'm convinced of will be more and more important as we look on developments across the world in the decades ahead. We are entering into a world of hyper-connectivity. We all know that there are all sorts of figures that you can use in order to illustrate this. They're all staggering in their implications. It was only two decades ago that the net really started to become reality. The web was invented in 1991, the first commercial browsers in uh, 1994. That's when it all started, and we know where we are today. 
but where will we be in another decade, in two or in three? With the present pace of change, I think it is beyond the imagination of anyone in this room. But of one thing, I think we can still be certain. The lesson of the development of Sweden and the lesson of the development of the two North Koreas will retain its validity in the decades to come. And it is, of course, around these issues that we are coming together here in Stockholm these days. Sweden has been among the countries. And let me also mention the United States. And let me also mention the Netherlands. Launching somewhat of a global diplomatic offensive for the freedom of the net in the last few years. For us, the freedom of the net and the freedom on the net is the new front line for the fight for freedom in the world. In recent months, we have been working hard within the United Nations Council on Human Rights with these uh, issues, based on the excellent and groundbreaking report by Special Rapporteur Frank LaRue sitting down there. I think it was the, when we had the special session of the Council on February the 29th, it was the Internet Society in the statement that they presented that said that the key article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Article 19, reads, and I quote them, quote, reads like a definition of the Internet, even though it was written more than 20 years before the invention of the Internet Protocol, end of quote. And that is indeed the case. I think the task ahead of us is fairly obvious. As the world moves online, we must not leave the protections of freedom offline. Because in a world of accelerating hyperconnectivity, that would endanger freedom of human rights in a way perhaps unparalleled in recent history. The world must not switch off freedom as it switches on the net. We all know roughly what's happening out there. Two decades after the concrete walls dividing the old world came down, we see new cyber walls dividing the new world coming up. The Great Firewall of China might be the most well-known of these, but there are many other walls coming up in many countries. Reports by Freedom House and, I, and others provide ample documentation. And I think with that we urgently need an international agreed framework for how to deal with these issues. That's why we seek in cooperation with like-minded countries really across the globe to continue the discussion in the Human Rights Council about the principles that must apply. The good news is that those principles are rather easy. And the good news is that those principles are also, as a matter of fact, already part of international human rights law and have been well described in the report I just referred to. And if we succeed in the UN Human Rights Council, we will, of course, take the issue further in the global dialogue on these issues. We want to take as one example the European Union that is more active on these issues. It is, after all, about the very values that our union is based on, and it reflects also our core interests on the global stage. There is no reason why the European Union should not be in the forefront of the global debate on these issues. Sometimes it should be granted this will take us into difficult dis discussions also with the important partner countries. So be it. Our values are not for sale. And in those and other discussions, I believe it will be increasingly important to point out, as I mentioned here, the development aspect of the issue. Anyone who has been following, following the recent developments in China the last weeks, months, can see that in the battle between the hierarchies from the top and the networks from the bottom, 
It is the former that are stumbling and the latter that are gaining. You can, technology is fairly easy, you can block the one word or the other. But it is very easy to invent another word that effectively means the same thing and then suddenly that is all over the net. And at the end of the day, it is the free flow of information that is the best defense also against the false flow of information in a truly networked society. Censorship will simply not do the trick. And the message of history is clear. A regime afraid of information is a regime that fears its own future. Having said all of this, I believe it is fair to say that these societies that we are discussing, China among them, are today much more open than they used to be. And there should be no doubt that the development, the widespread of the information and communication technologies is an important part of that broad, big, historical change that we see. We see impact, of course, in other situations as well. In February 1982, the then president of Syria, Hafez al-Assad, was able to massacre between 20 and 40,000 people within a couple of days by artillery in the city of Hama without the word knowing. It took literally weeks before information started to come out. And it took literally years for the full story to be truly established. Now, we live in different times. There are cell phones, there is the net, there is Skype, there is YouTube, and we see minute by minute, we see megabyte by megabyte, a Syrian revolution for democracy and dignity that is gaining strength by the day. In the way it is being played out, it would not have been possible without these technologies and without these advances that we are discussing here. And the battle, of course, goes on in very many other countries. Vietnam, where the prominent blogger Nguyen Phan Hue now is facing a second trial on truly trumped up charges of spreading propaganda against the state. He's been in, behind bars since 2008, held in communicado for the past 18 months without being able to meet his lawyer or family. He used his blog to expose corruption and promote human rights in Vietnam. And I was happy to meet here one of you, wouldn't give any names, who has been uh, similarly in jail in another country for putting things on the blog, but where concerted diplomatic and efforts means that he is able to be with us here today. And look at a country like Iran, which is interesting in very many respects. The regime there jams satellite signal, not very successfully, but they devote a lot of resources to it. They seek to censor the internet, well, they are trying, and trying hard. They attempt to monitor computers and cell phones, yep, they try. And lately, internet restrictions have become more severe, bloggers are frequently yelled and harassed. In his message for Navruz, the Persian New Year, President Obama rightly highlighted these very developments. But at the same time, he announced that the United States is lifting sanctions on services and software related to the exchange of personal communications over the Internet, including things related to web browsing, blogging, email, instant messaging, chat, social networking, photo and movie sharing. That's the right way to go in order to combat those that want to restrict the, the web and the net. But we must also be aware of the technologies that we deliver. We must seek to blog the delivery to these and other similar regimes of technologies for monitoring and intercepting the internet and communications. That is what the European Union has already done. In the case of Syria and in the case of Iran, and we should not hesitate to do it in other cases where there is a sound 
reason for doing it. And some of us, as you know, go further than that. Sweden, and we are not alone, has an active program to support and promote technologies that makes it possible to break through and break down the cyber walls of censorship that are out there. We don't talk too much about the detail. It is the details that, of course, makes the difference. Cyber issues and issues related to the net are rapidly rising on the global political agenda. And they are, in my opinion, certain to be far more important five, not to speak, about ten years down the line. A lot now has to do with the concerns over cyber security. Some speak about the possibility of cyber wars in the future. Others are primarily concerned with the rapid rise of cyber crime, and we are discussing the issues related to the protection of intellectual property. But what this really all of it, the cyber crime and all of that, really reflects is that what is there in our world today, most of which is certainly good, some of it distinctly evil, is also there on the net itself. The net is a mirror of the world, the good, the bad, including the evil. And governments have a right and a duty indeed to defend and to protect its citizens. But it must be done in the online world as well as in the offline world in accordance with and under the law nothing else should, nothing else must be accepted. There are, of course, concerns that are very valid. There's a risk that the concern with the security of the net will be at the expense for the concern of the freedom of the net. Some talk very loudly about the security issues, while their main concern might, as a matter of fact, be to restrict the freedom of the net. That is in itself nothing new. We have seen it many times in human history. That's the balancing act that free societies always have to get right. But there is more reason to be truly alert in this age of accelerating globalization and emerging hyper-connectivity. These are then the numerous issues that I think we will be discussing, debating, exchanging information, exchanging views about in the next few days. Our task, the common task, is um, to build a strong and a global alliance for internet freedom, the freedom of and the freedom on the net in the years to come. It is the task, of course, of concerned governments. And I can assure you that the issue will be a most important one for my country, for Sweden. But it is no less a task for you, concerned individuals from around the world. Your power is great because you are riding the wave of the future and you encompass the hopes of so many for a world even better than the one of, the, of today. I hope these days in Stockholm will be truly lively, truly constructive, truly fruitful, and that you will leave from here being even more a part of that new global alliance for the freedom and the development aspect of the net. Most welcome and thank you.